I had an epiphany in a dream that I was having last night, a sort of dream in a dream, as it were. I was sitting in the grass, and uh, I was sitting on this sort of small little blanket that was spread out over the grass, and I had my infant son with me. And I was just holding his hands, looking into his eyes, smiling, making little baby noises, um, giving him little zerberts, and having this wonderful connection with my boy. And the epiphany was that I wasn't spending enough time with him, and that this is a fleeting moment, and that it's going to go away, and it's not going to last. And it's so important that I need to change my behaviors. I need to spend more time with my infant son because this time is fleeting. And then I woke up and I remembered that my son is a man and that I can't spend any more time with him like that. I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Welcome to Nine Cents. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of Armand World. I'm your host, Reverend Campbell. It is October 25th, and as of today, we have 43,065,378 worldwide cases of COVID-19, with 1,156,311 deaths. And I got a great show for you this week. That's right, in The Devil's Advocate, I summon the devil. In Infernal Informant, sue if you must. Lincoln Project rejects threat over Kushner and Ivanka billboards. And protest against mask requirements held at Utah Capitol. We're not the only ones, people. And in the Creature feature, I'm going to be talking about a book that I just finally got around to finishing. Aberat. Absolute Midnight. Uh, so look forward to that at the tail end of the show. Being a parent sucks. Sometimes you realize your own inadequacies, um, your own desires to reconnect with missed opportunities, uh, the what ifs, as it were. But what can you do? It's the curse of being a parent. Um, last night I hung out with a bunch of friends, which was fucking fantastic. We did a wine tasting session, which I have a massive headache still from, um, and uh, we were dressed up. My wife and I went, well, my wife went as a 1920s flapper. I went as a 1920s gangster. Had a great time. Looked fantastic. Um, and I'm just incredibly fortunate that I can get together with friends and do stuff like that from time to time in this crazy period of time we find ourselves in, right? Um, a pandemic is resurging massively natural disasters are hitting our coasts uh, and burning down our homes. And I get to go fuck around with a bunch of good friends. <laughs> I feel fortunate. Had a great time. All right. Um, on other news, I voted. Did you? See, my son didn't want to vote. We get mail-in ballots, and then I drop them off at the mail-in ballot um, bin right outside of our city hall. He didn't want to vote. And I told him that I don't care who you vote for. The act of voting is your way of having a say in the direction society takes. So think about it and do it, whether you want to or not. There are only a few things Americans have to do in order to have literally the freedom to do whatever the fuck you want virtually, right? There's only a few things. Pay taxes which I don't know why everyone bitches about. It's a good thing. It means you have fucking benefits in this society. You pay taxes. You show up for jury duty from time to time when called. 
and you vote. I mean, if you're a guy, you also have to sign up for, you know, the draft. But that hasn't happened in a very, very long time. And it's probably never going to happen again because we have enough people wanting to sign up uh, on their own. So what's the downside here, people? Why the hell do so many people not vote? Because they think they're special. The world revolves around them. Or maybe it doesn't matter who you vote for. You live in a state that doesn't uh, echo your politics. I don't give a fuck. This is your opportunity. And you're just going to squander it? You shouldn't even be in this country then. Get the fuck out. If you're not going to participate in how the country operates, why do you get to take advantage of the benefits of the country? Huh? Why do you get to suck at the fucking teat if you're not going to do your civic duty? You are a leech. You are vermin. And all you got to do to not be that is to register to vote and to get off your fucking ass and vote. And you get to choose who you vote for. If you want to vote for fucking Casper the Friendly Ghost, you can. You can write it in. But vote. Don't be a sucker. Don't be a leech. Vote, people. All right. Um, I'm continually reminded. Oh, I got another light, by the way. <laughs> it came in. I got one incandescent bulb and one LED. So I'm hoping the lighting is okay. And we had like this mass massive, crazy, like out of nowhere snowstorm this morning. And so I'm wearing a sweater. So that's why. It's cold outside, people. Um, I'm continually reminded <laughs> about, and I know I harp on it all the time, but I can't help when it's shoved in my face. <sighs> because you identify as a Satanist does not mean you're not a sheep. Does not mean you are an individual. I am consistently reminded of how pathetic online Satanists are. How they jump to the rescue, polishing their good guy badges. Hey, I want to jump on your cause du jour bandwagon and be a part of your fight because clearly I got nothing going on in my life to warrant any fucking attention. How pathetic online Satanists are when they band together in their groups. You don't like that person? Oh, now I don't like them either. I don't want to be seen as someone who doesn't like the person that you don't like because then maybe you won't like me. And if you don't like me, what does that mean? Uh, it means maybe you're an individual with objective perspective. But no, that's not what really happens. What really happens are people jumping on other people's bandwagons because they want to be cool or, or they want to be liked or they want to have a tick box or a fucking thumbs up or a follow or a friend or a fucking message underneath their fucking message. That's the quality of Satanist today. Not, I have accomplished X or Y, hence witness my value. No, no, no. It's, look how the world is shitting on me. Oh, and everyone else patting them on the back and saying, oh, I don't like those people either. You're still a good person in my eyes. Fuck you and fuck your shit. If you were actually a Satanist, you wouldn't be on social media in the first place. You would be too busy living your life. You pathetic fucks. And I wouldn't fucking care, except that now when I walk out the street and someone sees me and says, you're a Satanist, you are what they think of! Not people actually achieving anything in life. Not people succeeding and being individuals. They're seeing sheep. Sheep! The very thing that you claim not to be. You pathetic fucking weak piece of shit i'm tired of being associated with such fucking mediocrity when did satanism suddenly become this fucking herd think at what point 
did you start championing psychic vampires over individuals of value? When did that happen? Do you recognize when that happened? Did there come a, a, a moment in your life when you just suddenly said, I'm going to ignore everything in the Satanic Bible. I'm going to ignore everything about what it means to be a Satanist. And I'm just going to polish my good guy badge and be a psychic vampire supporter. Fucking pathetic. Uh... <laughs> you probably should be, Lori. <laughs> no, I just get frustrated because I'm every once in a while someone shows me something and I'm stunned. I'm just floored by the banality of Satanists. And it frustrates me to no end. Because it's not like we don't have examples of exemplars. It's not like we don't have a roadmap codified by the founder of this religion about what it means to be a Satanist. And yet you have Satanists all huddling around in these little circles, these little communities. When we have literature overtly saying that Satanism is not a communal religion, and yet Satanists are gathering together communally. Something's got to give people you can't claim to love vanilla and then only eat chocolate. <laughs> it's not the same thing. It's a different beast altogether. If you want to be a Christian who huddles together in uh, communities and supports each other and backs each other up and wipes away the tears of their miserable, pathetic lives, then go! Do your thing! I don't care! Just stop calling yourself Satanist because... You're clearly not. But then everyone makes these big fucking arguments. No, no, no. That's This is just us supporting each other online. I'm not using it as a crutch. No, you're addicted to mutual jack-off. <laughs> a mutual masturbation fest. That's what you need. Because you're sad. Because you're pathetic. If you were actually a Satanist, you would be an individual. And it wouldn't matter to you. And you would just go about your life, not checking in every single fucking day. Did someone reply to my post? I got to post again. Did someone say something about me? Did someone say something about someone else? Is it someone else that I liked? Oh, I got to go comment on that thing. I got to be in the moment. I've got to catch on to that fucking new trend. What about Satanism is about following trends? We need a fucking enema, man. We gotta wash all of you shitty ass fucking turds that are clinging to the bowels of this fucking religion and flush you like the fucking shitty ass lumps of worthlessness that you are. I'm tired of being associated you by you associated anywhere near you simply because we share a religion because you're ruining what this religion means in the eyes of everyone and you can argue well what does that matter to you why do you care what everyone thinks because this religion is viewed from the outside believe it or not and the public will judge this religion on its merits based on those that are a part of it and if everyone that's a part of it is a fucking herd sheep fucking uh, hanger on little monkey in a barrel clinging on to the next m satanic monkey waiting to be put back into the fucking barrel well then that's what people see satanism as not as the self-affirming rational religion that can actually build up and champion the original that it is but rather as just another sewing circle where old biddies get together and spread the latest gossip. It's fucking pathetic. It's fucking pathetic. <laughs> it's funny because you could easily jump into that bandwagon and you'd get so much more attention and you get so more, more, many more followers and so many more hugs and pats on the back and pats on the head and strokes on your shoulders and supports. But then you'd be selling your fucking soul to the sad, pathetic social media Satanists. 
Who the fuck wants that? <laughs> Please. It's fucking disgusting. That being said, <laughs> I do have a really good show planned out. Uh, let's do a little devil's advocate. I figured since it's Halloween season, this is October, that's Halloween season to me. Um, why not talk a little greater magic ritual summoning the devil? So let's do it. All right, I'm throwing up an image. Uh, as I'm doing this, I want to reply to uh, a comment that I saw really quick. Give me one second. Um, Reverend, you just described why I left the TST or left TST. Yeah, you'd be surprised at how, uh, how TST likes so many Satanists are. On one hand, they're shitting on this organization that is a social political club and the other hand joining together lockstep in a social <laughs> progressive club <laughs> all right do your thing man whatever all right uh, i summon the devil asmodeus satan kali lucifer belly all of uh, lilith and leviathan are real to me all right I receive gifts from them in the ritual chamber. There seems to be some confusion over greater magic, even to this day, which astonishes me. Uh, and the true magic is, in my opinion, how each Satanist who chooses to practice greater magic interprets it and how we interpret it differently. And I find that fascinating. Um, when I'm in the ritual chamber, the decompression chamber, I'm literally opening the gates of hell. I am calling out to my infernal brothers and sisters and I'm inviting them to join me and to provide strength to whatever I happen to find myself in that chamber for. And when I envision them joining me, it's very much sort of like uh, Cenobites being called um, uh, and like entering the room, right? So you have... If it's a group ritual, you have you as the priest in the front calling the infernal names. You have the participants echoing those calls behind you traditionally. And then you have the demons and devils themselves entering into the space, into the ritual chamber area. For me, it's not just calling names because people have some association with those names. I'm literally calling out to my friends. I'm calling out to those who I stand with on the outskirts of the pit of fucking hell. Because I am as they are. I don't differentiate myself from the four crown princes or insert the name of your favored demon or god here. I am a god. I am my own god. I am as dark and insidious or as bright and joyful as any of the other omnipotent beings that I invite into the ritual chamber with me. I distinctly remember one of my first rituals where I was uh, fleshing out the four crown princes of hell on a large wall, life size, and I had um, Takata and Fugue playing and I was just sort of in the zone, right? In the ritual space. And the air started vibrating. Uh, you could see uh, the smoke from the candles vibrating with the air as it vibrated. And I just sort of turned around. Instead of like bowing down and kneeling to these effigies of the gods, I turned around to them. So my back was to them. And I backed up into them so that I wasn't in front of them. 
I was standing shoulder to shoulder with them because they never judged me. They never said that because I thought X or I acted Y, it was wrong. They just said, this is your nature and I celebrate you as an individual acting in your nature. And from that moment on, I never feared things that go bump in the night. I never feared the monsters that may be in your closet or under your bed because I was one of them. I was that thing that went bump in the night. Those are my friends. Those are my brothers and sisters. I don't fear them. They're my friends. So from time to time, when I'm in the ritual chamber and I invite them into the space with me, plus a few friends, if that's the case, it is very much not these foreign entities entering an area. It's a reunion of friends that I've already known for years who have backed me and supported me in times of sorrow and distress and have championed and celebrated me in times of victory and achievement. Sometimes they just can't come. Just like a friend may not be able to help you move or may not help you be able to, you know, help you tear down your tree or something. But sometimes they can and sometimes they do. And when they do, there's this overwhelming sense of power. And it's not this sole one-sided thing because each of us Satanists hold this immense amount of power. And you get two of those together and it grows. And you get three and it grows. And four and it grows. And there's this sense of primal authority in that connection. And that's what I have in the ritual chamber. And that's why I know whenever I'm walking around in the real fucking world, I don't fucking worry <laughs> about anything. And whenever some pathetic asshat is trying to cast whatever ookiness on me, I don't have to worry because I got my fucking friends at my back. I've got the devils of fucking hell at my back. And I got theirs. Because when I go out in life, all of my achievements, all of my actions are reflecting positively on them. Giving them power. So that old myth of signing away your soul in order to get something in return. Pfft, please. Weak people have to sign away something to get something in return strong people have something to give and it's a reciprocal relationship you help me in this moment and i am going to help you in the real world that is my ritual experience that is how i summon the devil not because i have a particular right or i scrawl a particular symbol but because he's my fucking friend. And when he needs me, I come. And when I need him, he comes. That's the relationship I have with hell. I mean, it's part of a tradition that dates back to immemorial times of humanity, trying to tap into ancient wisdom. And we have that. We have that on our fucking fingertips. When I was a kid and I started dabbling in the occult and I wanted to tap into this greater power, this greater magic that was out there, that I could feel out there. I just had to realize I was looking in the wrong place. And as soon as I picked up that satanic Bible and as soon as I went into the decompression chamber, I felt it emanate out of hell and pass through me. And I felt that power. And I knew I was in the right fucking place. So yeah, um, I don't think of ritual as a series of steps that you have to go through. I don't see ritual as 
um, this place you have to go and you hope something happens. I see it as a connection between some beings that have always had my back and I have always had theirs. And sometimes they can't show and sometimes I don't show, but that's what it means that when it matters, when you can, you show. Friends. And if you don't understand any of that, <laughs> I don't blame you. Maybe someday you will. But that's, that's why greater magic rituals are so important to me. I don't do them all the time. In fact, I don't very, do them very often at all. But when I do, and I open that gate, it's only open for a little bit. So you've got to be in the moment when it's open. And when you ring that bell to close, to erase the, the residual atmosphere in the room, that gate doesn't close immediately. It takes time. And I like to just sit in that moment. Because again, I don't do it very often. And so I'm not around my friends very much. And it's very nice to be in their presence. And so I like to just absorb it. Just for a moment. And then go back out to the real world and focus on my life and how I can be a better individual and achieve more of my goals. Have you summoned the devil? Is your experience anywhere near mine? Is it different? I'm curious what it's like for you. This is probably going to confuse a lot of people. <laughs> but if you get it, well, you get it. You know. Let's do a little infernal format. Let me change out the image as we move through here. Um, this one's first. Sue so if you must, Lincoln Project rejects threat over Kushner and Ivanka billboards. This is from The Guardian. The Lincoln Project will not be intimidated by empty bluster, a lawyer for the group wrote late on Saturday in response to a threat from an attorney for Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner over two billboards put up in Times Square. Sue if you must, Matthew Sanderson said. The New York City billboards show the president's daughter and her husband, both senior White House advisors, displaying apparent indifference to public suffering under COVID-19. Kushner is shown next to the quote, New Yorkers are going to suffer, and that's their problem, above a line of body bags. Trump is shown gesturing with a smile to statistics for how many New Yorkers and Americans as a whole have died. According to John Hopkins University, more than 8.5 million coronavirus cases have been recorded across the U.S. and more than 224,000 have died. Case numbers are at record daily levels, and one study has predicted 500,000 deaths by February. New York was hit hard on the pan pandemic's outset. The Lincoln Project is a group of former Republican consultants who have made it their mission to attack Donald Trump and support Joe Biden. On Friday, Mark Kasowitz, an attorney who was represented by the president against allegations of fraud and sexual assault, wrote to the Lincoln Project demanding the false, malicious, and defamatory ads be removed, or, quote, we will sue you for what will doubtless be enormous compensatory and punitive damages. The Lincoln Project responded that they would not remove the billboards, citing First Amendment rights of free speech and the, quote, reckless mismanagement of COVID-19 by the Trump White House. In a legal response on Saturday night, attorney Matthew Sanderson told Kasowitz, quote, 
Please, peddle your scare tactics elsewhere. The Lincoln Project will not be intimidated by such empty bluster. Your clients are no longer Upper East Side socialties, socialities, able to sue at the slightest offense to their personal sensitivities. Due to a gross act of nepotism, Sanderson wrote, citing Supreme Court precedent and substantial constitutional pro uh, protections for those who speak out, Trump and Kushner have become public officials whom Americans have the right to discuss and criticize freely. And the Lincoln Project is absolutely right. So, is it a little unfair? I don't know. It depends on your perspective. The truth is, they are public officials who work in the White House for their daddy, literally, <laughs> if you can believe that fucking statement. And uh, that means they are a party to the decisions made in the White House if they are the advisors to the president. And their advice has led to where we are right now, which is worse than everywhere else. So, is it fair? It depends on your perspective. One thing I have to say is the Lincoln Project, they're Republicans. Putting out these ads against a Republican president, that's pretty astounding. And I, I, I've always said this, Democrats are terrible at politics. They are the worst. They can't get out of their own way. They're the fucking worst. Republicans know how to smear. They know how to dig in. They know how to lie and cheat and manipulate. They know how to fucking put out ads. So is it surprising that Republicans are fantastic at putting out defamatory ads against other Republicans? <laughs> Not really. And I just stand back and slow clap. Because it's beautiful. It's just... It's amazing. Finally, someone is turning the fucking tables on these fucking pathetic liars that are using a public office to enrich themselves. Thank you. <laughs> Show them for the fucking monstrosities that they are, and you're on the same team too. I dig it. I dig it, man. I think it's the best. So great, so great. Uh, you bet greater magic must be very... Oh, a good satanic meditation arousal aspect could be helpful. Pre or post ritual. Oh, nice. I recently watched Antrim and After. Did some research. Astroth's behavior far more familiar. Oh, you guys are still talking about greater magic. All right, that's fair. Anyway, <laughs> I thought I'd bring out this article because I think it's fantastic. It's not often you see an attack ad against a Republican that is creative and pushes the boundaries not only of fairness, whatever that means, but also of effectiveness. And then when the Trump machine tries to threaten legislation, normally people back down and they cower. I don't know why. They're fucking pathetic. Because it's all fucking a lie. And yet, when you have Republicans doing it, they don't back down. They know how to act. They know how to attack. You gotta, whether you like them or not, whether you side with them politically or not, you have to recognize when someone's got game. And they got game. <laughs> you gotta hand it to them. No Democrat would have come up with that. Can you imagine a Democrat coming up with that attack ad? No fucking way. They just say stuff like, you know me and you know him. Vote for me? It's fucking pathetic. <laughs> they, they have no lesser magic game at all. Meanwhile, you've got fucking professionals in action. <laughs> this is the fucking difference, folks. Professionals versus fucking pretenders. All right, that's really all I want. <laughs> I just wanted to showcase how fucking great they are, man. I just, that's all. Let's do this next one. All right, let's see. This is pretty absurd, too. Protest against mask requirements held at Utah Capitol. This is from Fox 13 Now, the local Fox uh, news network. Protesters gathered Saturday at the Utah State Capitol building to voice the opposition to recent changes to coronavirus guidelines from Governor Gary Herbert and the state health department. Specifically, the guidelines surrounding mask requirements. Quote, we just, uh, we're just against the mask mandate, said Jed Burnham. Maybe not anti-mask, but against mandating them. 
The new guidelines require masks in counties around the state that are considered to have high levels of coronavirus transmission. Burnham said he thinks it's not the government's job to issue such requirements. What's the government's job, he asked, to preserve life, liberty, and property? He said that non-ironically. <laughs> to preserve life. <laughs> Does he not understand? The masks are protecting life. If not your own, then others <laughs> around you. That's the reason why they're mandating them. And only, I might add, in areas where the pandemic is especially vibrant. It makes perfect logical sense. And these fucking asshats are like, no, that doesn't make sense. Okay. Well, it's like saying the government needs to get their hands off of my uh, Medicare. Who do you think gave you the fucking Medicare, you dumb fucking hicks? Fucking Utah, man. The new mask guidelines require... Oh, I should add to that. Hold on. One of the groups at the protest, the Proud Boys of Utah, you can tell they're an intelligent bunch, who are listed as one of five active hate groups in the state by the Southern Poverty Law Center, compared mask requirements to the government taking a person's guns away, among other things. <laughs> because everyone remembers the Second Amendment, right? You have the right to free speech, to gather, to have your guns, and to not wear your masks. And that, that is how it goes, right? No? No? Oh, so they are fucking idiots. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> Those are things that happen in other countries, Burnham says. He's a self-described chaplain of the Proud Boys Salt Lake City chapter. They happen in socialist countries, but they don't happen here. This is a free country, he added. At what point do people think this is a free country? I accept that we have a lot of rights, but is it free? I don't know. Can you go around murdering people? Yeah. But are there consequences? Yeah. Can you go around without a mask? Yeah. Are there going to be consequences? Probably. Yeah. If there's a law and you decide to break that law, whether you agree or disagree with the law is irrelevant. Because the society that you are living in <laughs> put it into place. And here's the best part of all. If you disagree with it, you can actually vote and change the laws. But these fucking idiots are too stupid to understand that. And so they just want to shake their fist at the government saying, I have freedoms, I have rights that you have given me. And this is one of them, which it's not. But I think it should be, even though it's not. It is completely legal, Isabel said, Government Herbert, or even different counties who have made lockdown orders and tried to make it enforceable by fines. That's illegal, she says. Let people choose for themselves. How do you think we're having a resurgence right now of COVID cases? Why do you think our hospitals are beyond capacity literally right now? It's because we've let people decide for themselves. And I don't know if this is a new idea to you or not. But people are fucking stupid. People regularly vote against their own self-interest. They behave against their own self-interest. And that doesn't just harm them. That harms people around them. That's why they put the mandate in place. Not for, to protect your stupid fucking ass, but to protect the people around you who are not fucking stupid. Get it? No? Let's go on. In a recent press conference, Governor Herbert pointed out the fact that the guidelines are public health orders rather than the state-issued mandates. Quote, it is a matter of an ordinance, Herbert said. It is an order from our Utah Health Department to help us all be safe and keep our economy going. There's nothing bad about it. It's a good thing. End quote. Proud Boy members, like Burnham, say the government should focus on balancing life and liberty when it comes to public health guidelines and requirements. Quote, you can't preserve life and get rid of liberty and property, he said. So, 
If to preserve life they needed a big facility, they can't come and take your home, even if you have a big house, right? They can't do that. Actually, they can. <laughs> well, I suppose with eminent domain they could. Yeah, you fucking idiot. Uh, he said, clarifying his statement. <laughs> Fucking proud boys. Uh, there were several different groups gathered at the Capitol on Saturday, but they all shared a similar message. They felt that the new guidelines represent government overreach into people's lives. If the government's purpose is to protect its citizens and there is a problem that is hindering the life of its citizens and it puts a mandate in to then protect the lives of its citizens, it is not going against the liberty and life of the citizens. A plus B equals C in this case. It actually does. <laughs> Why did... How are these people breathing still? I, I just don't get it. Fucking idiots. Mandatory vaccines I got a problem with. <laughs> I'm glad those don't exist. Oh, man. I, it, if, I love uh, in the last presidential debate when... Uh, the president said, I have a very good general ready. He's ready to give out the vaccines in an unprecedented rate. I'd like to see that action. That, that's a military action going door to door. What, sticking people with needles against their will? That's a different thing than wearing masks, people. That's a different thing entirely. And it, it's a made-up thing at this point. So let's not get hung up on it. Um... I just find it very interesting that even now, even in October of the year of the pandemic, people are complaining. The state is open. People can have their businesses. They can go to work. They can do whatever the fuck they want. They can go to restaurants. They can dine in, dine out, take away. They can do literally whatever they want. All they got to do is cover their dirty fucking mouths. And knows too. Some of you don't seem to get that part. Just do that. That's it. That's all you have to do. And you're acting as if we're telling you you need to fucking stitch a symbol on your shoulder and march into a fucking oven. Come on. <laughs> oh. It is that type that I'm just hoping gets the virus and it fucking kills them because let's be honest that would be natural selection at its finest i just don't happen to be that fortunate the rest of society protects these fucking scum these vermin and allows them to continue spreading their fucking idiocy that's the real crime here but whatever whatever um, maybe he's just going to roll out the National Guard and shoot darts <laughs> rounds into people. Yeah, I, I can imagine that. I, I gotta be honest, after he called the National Guard on the, some of the lockdowns uh, nationwide in some select cities, and those National Guard were literally firing rubber bullets at people who were on their own front porch on their own property, I would not put it past him to do that whole fucking dart gun uh, strategy you speak of. It's insane to me. It's absolutely crazy. Just wear a mask. That's it. You're going to protect yourself. You're going to protect the people you love and the random strangers you meet along the way. That's it. And then wash your hands when you get home. It's not hard. It's not putting you out. <laughs> it's, it's literally protecting the, the actual citizens. And that is the job of the government. So if you don't like it, maybe if you could do us all a favor, just get the fuck out. I don't know, walk into the ocean or, I don't know, into some trees somewhere. Just leave the society because you clearly don't want to be a part of it and you're not contributing to it, so you're actually making it worse for those who want to be a part of that society. So, just move along, please. Get the fuck out. You don't get to be in a militia acting against the government that is trying its best to protect you. You just don't get that option. That's not, that's not a reality that we need to be having. The reality is, is we clearly get to, even though they're the real fucking terrorist threat in this country, but no one wants to do anything about that. So, you know, <laughs> you just have to deal with them. Fucking people. 
All right, that's <laughs> that's kind of all I had. Let's do this uh, final segment in the creature feature. This next one up here. See, man, that intro when I was screaming, <laughs> I ruined my voice. <laughs> Damn it. I've got to tone it down. Take it from like 11 to 3. That's what I got to do. I got to learn how to do that. All right, I'm talking about The Aberat, Absolute Midnight. This is a uh, novel by Clive Barker. I don't know if you've heard of him. <laughs> I'm a fan. He's a fantastic author. Um, this is actually a really old novel too. I got this um, back when it first came out and uh, I think it was like, this is terrible that I don't have it listed when it was actually released uh, in 2011. It's literally taken me until now to finally get around to reading it because what I do is get different books and I'll read portions of each book and whichever one is interesting me in the, interested, interesting to me in the moment, I will finish reading that and then move on. And then I just, so I have multiple books that I'm partially into. And then I just suddenly, you know, at times finally just say, oh, you know what? I got to finish that book. Well, it was this turn for Absolute Midnight. So this is the third in uh, what will be, I think, uh, seven novels planned right now. One thing that I don't think people appreciate about Clive Barker, if you've never really read any of his sagas, is that he is an incredible world builder. Um, a lot of people think of Clive Barker as these standalone horror story type author, you know, or, or they just think of him in terms of the Hellbound Heart or Hellraiser as it's most commonly known. He is so much deeper than that. And his fantasy work is, I don't want to say better than his horror because I genuinely love his horror, but it is equally on par to his horror. And he has this really wonderful way of mixing magic and reality that for my personal worldview fits in really wonderfully. So he has a series about the books of the art, which is very connective tissue with Satanism in my mind. Um, and so I've always really loved his work and I try to read all of it, even the ones that I don't particularly enjoy, I still find value in. This, it's not the strongest of the three, of the original, of the first three that he's written in the Aberat series. Um, it's the third book in the New York Times selling uh, Aberat series by Clive Barker. It has more than 125 full color illustrations that Clive Barker did. And one thing a lot of people don't realize is that Clive Barker is an artist. He's a painter. And so he paints tons of imagery for these stories that he puts out. And it's really wonderful to be able to see his vision along with the vision that he's writing. It, it, it's this really wonderful juxtaposition between the, the visual and the um, literary arts. It's centered around the following. Candy Quackenbush, who's the hero, this female, her allies and her enemies are back in Aberat Absolute Midnight, the third book in Clive Barker's New York Times bestselling Aberat series. Quote, the waiting is over. Tomorrow will be no dawn. Only midnight, absolute and eternal. Mater Motley, the old mother of darkness herself, following the events of Aberat and Aberat, Days of Magic, Nights of War, has created a scheme that may destroy the Aberat, a vast archipelago where every hour is an island in one eternal day. When Candy discovers Mater Motley's secret plot, she realizes that only she can bring an end to the destruction. Only she can stop a complete darkness threatening to abolish all hope and happiness from the Aberat. Gina McIntyre of the Los Angeles Times thus identified protagonist Candy Quackenbush after reading Absolute Midnight. Like Dorothy or Alice before her, 16-year-old Candy is an innocent plucked from the mundanity of her everyday life and thrust into a mystical place filled with untold wonders and horrors. Barker acknowledges his heroine's literary lineage, but he also crafts a wonderfully contemporary girl who is brave, resourceful, loyal, and willing to sacrifice herself for the betterment of the world. Now, again, this is a young adult reader book. This is not an adult fiction. This is not a children's book. The, you know, arguably, it could be. Um, and so you have to kind of put yourself in that mindset when you're reading it. 
but it's I find a lot of value in having this female protagonist experiencing this sort of completely new realm, very much like you know Dorothy over the rainbow um, in Oz and or, or Alice through the Looking Glass um, and experiencing Wonderland and just sort of living in her relatable reality state of mind while witnessing the abnormal and amazing. And then her ability to tap into that new world and manipulate it through her behavior and through her uncovering of her own abilities and magic. It's fun and it's entertaining and it's got some really dark villains and it's got real consequences in the story and it's got some really funny and colorful and strange and obscure protagonists and antagonists. I mean, the whole series is a lot of fun. So if you like fantasy, if you like Clive Barker, if you just like to enjoy a whole different world that really is built out and fleshed out and feels like it could be, you know, in someone's imagination, a real place, I highly recommend the Abra series. It's a lot of fun. And this latest book, um, it just continues that fun. I don't know. I dig it. I I read the first Ab Rat with my son when he was a little baby. I read the second Ab Rat with my daughter when she was a little baby. And now reading this third, I'm feeling this connective tissue between me sharing these experiences with my children and then solitarily finishing, is that a word? Uh, finishing this book by myself and the fact that it leaves on this wonderful cliffhanger and there's this promise of stories to come. It's very, it's very fun. It's very exciting for me. Um, Disney actually bought the rights to this back when the first Abrat book came out. Uh, I think it was like 2002 or something like that. And they were going to do a whole movie series off of it. But for whatever reason, the extension of their license ended. They didn't do anything with it in that time. And now I don't think it's actually being pursued by anyone. But it is definitely one of those series that you could see making a huge splash on screen. Because it is, again, you know, he's already fleshed out the imagery uh, visually with his paintings. And it's such a colorful book when you read it that you could imagine it just being this wonderful, empowering tale. I hope someday they do. It'd be a lot of fun. And, well, quite frankly, it's a very good book. So, anyway, check it out if you dig it. If you don't, oh well. All right, what are you saying? Palindrome is the same backwards as forwards. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's the other thing is uh, Apparat is palindrome. Uh, that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, I have to give a brief pause here um, because I know that intro was very <laughs> out of left field. I get shared things from time to time and it just, I have to get it out. I don't like to dwell in stuff. I like to just get it out there and then not think about it. I don't like to steep, you know what I mean? So I get it out there. And sometimes that means that unfortunately you guys are going to hear my ramblings. And if you don't appreciate it, you can always turn it off. You don't have to expose yourselves to it. Don't complain about that, which you need not subject yourself to. Um, in my particular case, I'm doing that just by complaining about it. So I'm part of the problem. <laughs> what do you want? I do what I can. Um, <laughs> thanks, dog. I appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, I had a lot of fun. I know I started this show early. I've got another Satanist on Cinema in a little bit. I wanted to get some dinner between the two, so I had a little bit of space uh, between them. So um, I hope you guys are going to hang out uh, in just a little bit and watch that. That's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about a lot of really good films. And uh, if you want to talk about some great horror films with us, please tune in. 7.30, we're going to do the show, me and Satanist Cameron John. It'll be good times. Until then, or until next week, hail Satan, everyone. <laughs>